Let's take a look at the Reddit thread of the worst things doctors have said to people. I'll start. After my professional boxing match with Chris Avila, I went backstage where they do a medical exam. And the doctor that's supposed to check you over literally goes to me, well, you're a doctor, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I feel okay. He goes, you're good. I'm like, no, 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 no. Check me and make sure I'm okay. Check my pupillary reflexes. Don't just ask me, you good bro? And consider that a medical exam. Just because I'm a doctor doesn't mean I can take care of myself in a situation where I just got done getting punched in the face. When I was like 20, my endocrinologist took a good look at me and asked, are you okay with your face being so asymmetrical? I had never really noticed it before, but boy, have I noticed it since. I need more information on this because initially my reaction, my gut was to get offended because why are you judging someone's appearance? But then I looked at the specialty of the doctor that said it, endocrinologist. This is a non-surgical specialty. So this doctor is usually not the one performing surgery or recommending to perform plastic surgery or appearance surgery. What endocrinologists do look for is asymmetries in glands because glands release hormones. And now an asymmetry on the lower portion of your face or perhaps your neck can signal to the endocrinologist that something unusual is going on in that gland. Therefore, they would be pointing out asymmetries. Maybe they shouldn't point it out like that where it could be easily misinterpreted, but they should say something along the lines of, has your face always been asymmetrical? Because when you ask it that way, then you can explain to the patient why you're asking. Because if it's been there for a long period of time, that means nothing's changed, that's the way you were born. As opposed to if over the last two weeks you didn't notice it, but wow, this side is more full, then we can act and start an investigation. A nurse of some kind took my blood pressure. He said what the numbers were. I asked, is that good? He said, I'm not qualified to give you professional opinion on the matter, you should ask your doctor. I asked, but like unprofessionally, is that good? He said, unprofessionally? Well, in my purely personal opinion that I'm sharing with you as an individual and not in any medical or official capacity whatsoever, you should buy stronger deodorant. <laughs> oh! Oh man. Yeah, just wait for the for the professional <laughs> advice. You have pretty blood followed by I bet you have heavy periods. What? That is some vampirish. I've heard people say you have pretty veins, but they're not actually commenting on the beauty of your veins. What they're commenting on is the fact that it will likely be an easy blood draw because if you can visualize the veins, it's a lot easier to not have to repoke you multiple times because they keep missing. Color of blood does not <laughs> dictate whether or not you have heavy periods is what I'm trying to say. Not me, but mom. She's in remission for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that invaded her brain. She was getting a scan to confirm the cancer had left her brain and the doctor came in and said, good news, we've scanned your brain and confirmed that there's nothing in there. <laughs> that this is a common joke. And I actually say a variant of this. Uh, if I'm looking at the patient's ears, I say, like I look at one end and I look at the other end, I'm like, wow, I can see completely through. I guess there's nothing in there. Uh, a better one that I do with kids, because they're always like nervous what you're looking at and they don't know. So I say that I'm looking in their ears and I go, wow, I see someone's been paying attention to math. It's all really sticking in there. They go, really? I don't even pay attention to math. My gynecologist, while trying to remove my IUD when the strings weren't visible and fishing through my cervix with local anesthesia, thank God, okay? Come here, kitty, kitty. Ew, what? In all honesty, I think he spaced out and was very concentrated to avoid unnecessary pain. He was most definitely his cats and the words just came out. He burst out laughing with embarrassment and said, sorry, more than I could care to count. Honestly, I thought it was hilarious. I've been seeing him for a long time for many IUDs and he's a gem. Okay, the only thing that troubles me about this story is many IUDs. Because for example, some IUDs are meant to come out after five years, although they can stay a little bit longer. And there's some that stay in 10 years. I mean, unless you've been seeing this doctor for decades, many IUDs is kind Kind of interesting. For those who don't know, IUD means intrauterine device. It's like this little T-shaped thing that we insert into the cervix that is a contraceptive. It prevents you from getting pregnant. It's actually quite effective. The strings that we're talking about are strings at the end of it that end up coming into the vagina that the doctor then ideally should shorten to some degree. If you cut them too short, they could actually be sharp and you won't be able to reach it to to pull it out and put a new one in or just remove it in general. The doctor here, and I really hate to admit this, very early in my career, I was talking to a male patient. I had to ask him about penile discharge and I couldn't remember what the professional way to ask was. Do I say, no, no, that's not right. Come on, think, damn it, you're a doctor. Wait, there's too long of a silence. Dong, I went with dong. Oh. 
An easy way out of this is just to point to the region. Say any discharge down there. And then if they have questions or they're not sure which down there you're talking about, then you could specify. What I run into is the issues with poo. Do you say number two, like you're a four-year-old? Do you say bowel movement, like you're a GI professor? Do you say poop, like you're now a four-year-old and you've graduated from number two? Or do you say crap? Like what What feces, <laughs> like like you're an archeologist? What? What is the term? I usually lead with bowel movement and if I sense confusion, I say poo. What would you do? I think I'm a poop guy, but I'm not happy about it. Oh, and I hate saying stool. How does a chair make its way into your large intestine, rectum, out of your anus? You're looking pleasantly underweight. I don't know what that means, and that is disgusting. A doctor should not put flirtatious undertones on talking about someone's health. We learned this very early on where we listen to someone's heart or their lungs and we're taught to say things are normal as opposed to good or perfect because they can easily be misinterpreted. In fact, when we do our simulated patient encounters where we work with patients to perform uh, a pap smear, a digital rectal exam, which is a finger in the bum. When we do those simulated encounters, we're taught instead of calling uh, the, th the, the pieces of metal that patients put their heels in, instead of calling them stirrups, call them foot rests because those carry implications. Instead of saying, I'm gonna insert my finger, you're gonna say, I'm gonna use my digit. There's ways to make medical exams more comfortable. And I think we need to do a better job in the medical community than saying ridiculous shit like you're pleasantly underweight. Back pain, I'm not young. Doctor just said basically, well, that's just life for you. You're tall. So I'm just gonna end up being hunched over 90 year old. Lol, you're not gonna see 90. How many tall old people have you ever seen? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's just, that's douchebaggery as a person. Forget doctor, you're just being an asshole. Not me, but a friend. She had just gone through a miscarriage after trying to conceive for a while. Since she was quite young, the doctor asked, well, you didn't really want to have the baby, right? That's really, really wrong. You could be really hurting someone who just lost a child. The question you need to ask is, well, how do you feel about this? If the patient is willing to open up and wants to share, you could then build off of it. It's very common that a patient of mine will present the situation like, I, I, I just got divorced. Typical human reaction is to say, I'm sorry. But me as a medical health provider and a mental health provider, I oftentimes will say, well, how does that make you feel? Because they might be like, I am so happy. That was the worst time of my life and now I'm stoked. And I would be saying, I'm sorry to that, which is not really appropriate. So now I say, how does it make you feel? And then we build off that. Your breast tissue is extremely dense, which I'm sure your husband enjoys, but it's making difficult to get a good view. Oh my God, that's inappropriate on so many levels. In younger women, it is common that they have more dense breasts. So therefore, we don't often just do a mammogram if we're suspecting cancer. We also do an ultrasound. In fact, ultrasound sometimes gives us better views. And even then, it's sometimes difficult to catch things. So you do get a more difficult view with dense breasts, but you shouldn't talk about people's sex lives if it's not appropriate to the healthcare. I asked my cardiologist I had growing up what the goop was they put on before echoes. He said, yak snot. I believed him for a way too long. First of all, where was this cardiologist that they're even aware of what a yak is? Where are there yaks in such numbers that the first animal snot that comes into this cardiologist, it's not even a regular doctor, a cardiologist mind is yak. Where are yaks' homes? Mongolia, I think? No, you don't, don't act like you a know Chinese that. You are not allowed to act like you know that. If you don't need these pain meds now, you can save them for another time. ER doc giving me a full bottle of Dilaudid for a broken thumb. The early 2000s were a wild time. Yeah, that's, that's, now there's rules in place that actually the ERs can't give long-term prescriptions. And that's both good and bad. Good in that you're preventing opioid addiction and patients overusing them, abusing them, selling them, what have you. But also it creates issues for patients that aren't able to get in to see their doctor because doctors are so booked up. Therefore they're stuck sitting in pain. One time I went in for a general checkup and my doctor said, well, everything is fine with you except for that haircut. <laughs> I hope you know that doctor really well. Otherwise that's messed up. You're not depressed. It's your personality. 
It took a while to get over that statement and give medication another try. Could this statement be made genuinely? I think not. Because what they're saying is not even medically accurate. You can say that you don't meet the criteria for major depressive disorder, which has very strict DSM-5 criteria, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fifth edition that we use to make diagnoses of mental health conditions. Depressed is a mood. Uh, I can be depressed right now. It doesn't mean I have major depressive disorder, nor does it mean it's my personality. There are people who their personality trait can lead them to feel depressed. And there's a whole set of personality trait disorders that can lead someone to feel depressed. There's also something known as dysthymia, which we talk about quite often, which is a low mood, but not necessarily all the way to full depression for an extended period of time. But saying you're not depressed, it's your personality is wrong for multiple reasons. You're not depressed is a mood. You can't tell someone what their mood is. And saying it's their personality is not even a medical term. Personality trait is, personality is not. If you wanna help people, don't go into medicine. As a doctor, I'm nothing more than a people mechanic. And much like a car mechanic, I patch people back together well enough to get them out the door until I see them again. If I could go back, I'd run as far away from medicine as I could. I don't. If a doctor said that to you, that's kind of strange. It's a fair critique to some degree because the field of medicine is plagued by a really bad system behind it. Even the idea of patching people back together, that's a win. That's days you're giving back to a person to be able to be symptom free and continue on their job, see their family, do things they love. Even if you're giving them back a year until they see you again, that's a win. Yeah, they may come back multiple times because humans do break. And the beauty about humans as opposed to cars is cars don't fix themselves. Humans do. And it's our job as doctors to facilitate that healing and figure out how to remove risks to mitigate the times that the body does break down. Were you a teacher? Your bladder is huge. OBGYN during a pelvic ultrasound. I was indeed a teacher. Do teachers have big bladders? Is that like a known thing? Like they have to hold it because they're teaching classes for so long. They but, have a lunch and, and, and would stuff. That, would that cause a bladder uh, to expand? Is that a thing? I don't know. Is a bladder flexible like that? Well, a bladder is muscular, so it absolutely expands, it stretches. But to say that it stretches past normal, like that it doesn't rebound, that's the weird part. You have a brain tumor, but that's fine. Okay, I maybe hear the message, but I think it's delivered incorrectly. And I know people are gonna be like, what do you mean? How's the brain tumor fine? There's some brain tumors that are malignant, they're gonna spread, they're gonna grow, they're gonna be problematic. There's some that are benign, meaning that they're not malignant, they're not gonna spread, they're gonna stay in the area, but they can cause mass effect, which means that they press on certain areas of the brain, which obviously causes a huge issue, and therefore they're a problem, even though they're benign. And then there's other ones that are truly just benign, benign, it doesn't matter, like you can leave them, forget about them, and you don't need to follow them. That's on the rarer side, but they do happen. So I'm hoping that's what this doctor was talking about. You are really great at relaxing your cervix. Weird compliment, but I took it, damn it. She sounded so excited. <laughs> Can you even relax your cervix? Like, I I don't think that's a thing. This is no joke. I had a medical professional say, I used to be a heroin addict, so I'm pretty good at this, as she was putting in my IV. That's <laughs> on my last. Okay, some people will see this negatively. I agree with the writer, and I think this is funny. And I think it's also appropriate to say because I think those who have overcome challenges and have experienced certain things can provide value. And if they're being forthcoming with that information, as long as it's not inappropriate, I think it's, it's valuable to share. I've worked with a lot of psychologists and addiction specialists who have suffered with addiction themselves. Firsthand experience really goes a long way in being able to function as an empathetic provider. Following a checkup, we're going to have to remove your testicles. Just kidding, you should have seen your face. <laughs> I don't know what to, like, it depends. I know, I know you probably didn't even expect me to say it depends. You probably were like, no, he's gonna critique this. But like, I've gone into the room, a patient that I've known for years has something on their arm, and I go, oh man, Looks like we're gonna have to amputate. They already know I'm probably joking, so they get it. And the reason they know I'm joking is not because of my tone. In fact, it's the opposite. My serious tone and directness just jumping to amputation teaches them that it's a joke because they're so familiar with me. They know that if I'm breaking bad news, I wouldn't do it in such a careless way. But again, that can only happen as a result of good long form communication that we have, which is why it's important to get a primary care doctor. I love that we went from testicles to talking about primary care doctors.
things you should never do in a hospital. Click here to check that out, and as always, stay happy and healthy.